right. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord today, and I hope everybody's already been touched by the presence of God. We're glad to have you with us today. If you're visiting with us especially, we want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. We'd like to give you some church information, and ushers are coming forward at this time, and just raise your hand. They'll be more than happy to give you uh, that information, and if any time you'd love to have a visit or get together somewhere, we'll certainly be glad to do that, and that goes for anybody in the church as far as that's concerned. We'd just love to have great more, more times of fellowship like that. Also, want to continue to be much in prayer. We've had so many people that have been sick and asking the Lord to uh, be with them and to bless them in a very special way. And also, El Marie, want to continue to remember her and her family in prayer. Ask God's blessings upon them as well. Well, we're excited about what the Lord's got in store for us here this morning. And uh, we really want to worship Him in spirit and in truth today. Also, somebody might need these before they can go home today. Uh, is that yours, Debbie? Oh, <laughs> well, if nobody claims it, you know what I mean, huh? Uh, but if you didn't, don't have your keys in your pocket, uh, I'm going to set them right here for right now. And if you don't get it by this uh, end of the service today sometime, Debbie's going to get it and, and uh, go home with it, all right? All right, but it is good to be here in the house of the Lord today, and let's really worship God because He really is truly worthy of our praises and adoration, and uh, we can't thank Him enough, can we? So let's just let go of this old world and just let God have control of our hearts and our minds right now, and let's really begin to get in the spirit of worshiping Him, all right? And we're going to ask Brother Mike to come at this time now and, and the group, and let's really just sing out and let God know we are thankful today, thankful today. Amen. If you want to stand with us this morning, the cry of the early church, whenever they'd see each other coming, they would say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. What we want to do today is just worship him and praise him. Look, he could come before we finish this service today. We just want to uh, lift him up and praise him today as we sing, even so come. So we 
prayer. Well, our precious Heavenly Father, we know that your presence is here in our midst right now, and we are thankful, dear God, for the way that you have already begun to touch our hearts in a very special way. But we're also continuing to pray, as the song has already reminded us of, that glorious, wonderful promise that one of these days the church is going to be raptured out, and seven years later the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up his kingdom here on earth. Lord, I am so excited about when that day does arrive, and Lord, we'll be able to worship you and to praise you without any hindrance, without any presence of the evil spirits of this world, and God will just be able to have just the greatest of times. But God, right now, right here, right now, you know our needs. And Lord, I am praying in the name of Jesus that Satan is going to be defeated today. I pray that every demonic, demon, evil spirit in this world will have to run and, and, and get away from this place. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for everything that you do. Lord, we're praying that souls will be saved here today and throughout the world. We're praying that, dearly Father, that your churches today will lift up Jesus Christ and people are going to be drawn to him, dear Heavenly Father, in a great and a mighty way. Lord, continue. We pray in the name of Jesus for all that are sick, for all that are battling MS, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and many other things such as fibromyalgia and just so many different types of afflictions, Lord. We pray for them all, dear God. But we also pray for this nation, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray you'll touch this nation, dear God. We're praying for revival of your saints, but we're also praying for a great awakening, dear Heavenly Father, that people will be able to open their eyes. We pray that, dear Heavenly Father, you will tear down every stronghold of Satan today, dear God. And Lord, expose his evil doings, dear Heavenly Father. We pray for all that are serving in the military, dear Heavenly Father. And we're asking you to be with them and to also be with their families. We're praying, dear Heavenly Father, for all the law enforcement personnel, all the emergency see personnel dear heavenly father be with them protect them as they put their lives on the line every single day and we pray for every missionary dear god throughout the world lord bless them bless their families as well thank you dear god for what you've already started and dear heavenly father i want to thank you for what you're about to do for these things i ask in jesus name amen and amen When Jesus came to this earth as a man, if he had never done a miracle, a single miracle at all, he would still be God. That's right. So listen to the words of this song. <clears throat> Jesus 
and greet each other this morning. Our children can be dismissed from Children's Church and remain standing for off toy prayer.
Good morning. Good morning. I mean, get in your seat. <laughs> yeah, waiting on Geneva. <laughs> Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father, for this day, and thank you, Father, for allowing us to come to your house and worship you. I pray a special blessing upon each and every one that's come out this morning, Father. I pray especially, Father, for those that are here that are, that are lost and do not know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that something will be said, said a song will be spoken, a song, a word spoken that will draw them to you for, before they ever leave this building this afternoon today, Father. I pray, dear Father, that you would help us to use the tithes and offerings that you provide for us in the way that you would see fit. For us in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Years ago, we used to have some uh, ladies that we'd pick up and bring to church with us. Uh, one of them's name was Ms. Heath. John, that was your grandmother, Ms. Heath. What was her first name? Yeah, Ms. Heath. And she was a member at uh, Lutheran Church, uh, of a Freedom's Lutheran. And they didn't have service except on Sunday mornings. But every Sunday night, she would come to our church and Wednesday night and a revival, whatever we had. But you could ask Miss Heath, how are you doing today? She said, I don't need but one thing. And we'd say, what is that? I need more of Jesus. That's what she would say. I need more of Jesus. She never got tired of hearing about Jesus. And I believe one of her favorite songs was this one we're getting ready to do for you right now. And it says, tell me the story of Jesus. Friend, you and I today, we should never get tired of hearing that story. I know Brother Steve never gets tired of telling that story. Thank God for it. But we need to listen to it and hear it and learn from it. But listen to the words of this old song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus Right on my heart every word Tell
brings good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story. this song, I believe he heard the story of Jesus. Someone told him that. And he was able to pen the words of this one without knowing Jesus. He could never have written this song. But it says, I'm saved. Listen to this. Today I can say that I am saved. I'm glad today that I can say it didn't depend upon me because if it did, I know I wouldn't be saved. 
But it depends upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that saved my soul. He's the one that went to the cross of Calvary. He's the one that went through all that torment, pain, and agony. And he did it for you. He did it for me. And thank God I'm heaven bound. And I know that's a great comfort in my life. And if you're saved here today, it should be a great comfort in your life to know that you're saved. But there again, if you don't know that you're saved today, then why not right now? Why not today? Just ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of all of your sins and to save your soul and to come into your life and take control. You can do that today by faith. And Jesus Christ will save your soul and he'll begin to change your life for the better. It's an exciting life being a Christian. And I'm telling you, it's exciting just seeing what God is doing in this church and see what God is doing all around us as well. So if you will please this morning, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter number three. Romans chapter number three, and I'm going to read verse number four this morning. And if you will please stand with me now as I begin to read from this powerful passage of scripture from the book of Romans chapter three, verse number four. Your Bible says, God forbid. I wonder how many times that's in the Bible. I'm going to go home and check that out. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Our Heavenly Father, what a time you've already given us here today, and my heart is filled with rejoicing, and I'm thankful, Almighty God, that I am saved today, and it's all because of Jesus and because you, our Heavenly Father, was willing to send him forth to this old world and to go through all that man did unto him so that our sins could be paid in full. I know I'm heaven bound today, dear Heavenly Father, but there may be some here today that might not be sure. They might not have that complete satisfaction knowing that they are saved, born again, and ready to go. And Lord, I pray that today your Holy Spirit will bring great conviction upon this place. I really do, dear God, for those that are lost, I pray they won't be able to leave here today without really looking up toward heaven and accepting your son as their own personal savior. But for those of us that are saved, dear Heavenly Father, today, I pray that today, dear Heavenly Father, you would ransack our soul. I pray that, dear Heavenly Father, you'd find any hidden sin that might be in our heart or any known sin that might be in our heart. And I pray that, dear Heavenly Father, today we'll come under conviction of the Holy Spirit of God and that we'll repent. Dear God, come before you and confess our sins and we'll know that, dear Heavenly Father, you are faithful and just to con- cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can leave here today, dear God, rejoicing and saying that it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, God, again now for what you've done, and thank you for what you are about to do for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated today. God truly is blessing this service in a great way already. But really and truly, I'm excited about this because here again, I get to reaffirm the fact that I believe God. I believe God. Do you here this morning, do you believe God? I know I certainly believe God. And I believe that the Bible is saying here in the book of Romans chapter number three, the Bible here is basically telling us, let God be true. Let God be true. I went and looked at some statistics on the computer and I found out that really and truly here in America that nine out of 10 Americans say they believe in God. Can you believe that? Nine out of 10 Americans say that they believe in God. Well, I find it hard to believe that if that many Americans really truly believed in God, we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in right now. And I'm reminded really and truly how that even in the New Testament, the demons knew that there was a God. The demons knew Jesus, but they didn't know him as their Lord and as their Savior. So I look at the different statistics there, and I am really amazed at how that 9 out of 10, which is wonderful that they believe that there is a God, they believe in God. But then when you start really looking into it and try to find out really what's going on in America and why is America in the shape that it's in, I asked on the computer, well, how many Americans believe that the Bible is the Word of God. 
Now then we really begin to see what the problem is here in America. Do you realize that only 24% of Americans believe that the Bible is the Word of God? And out of that 24%, do you realize that only 15% believe that God created the world, that God created man, that God created this earth as we know it. So only about 15% of the people in America that say they believe in God believe that the Bible is God's word. Friends, I believe in God and I believe the Bible is God's word. Amen. I believe in the creation of man. I'm not ashamed of it, and I'm not backing down from it. I believe that God reached down to the dust of the earth and formed a likeness of himself and breathed into the nostrils, and Adam come to life. I believe God created man. I don't believe in this evolution business. I don't believe in the theory of evolution. I believe that God created man because I believe the Bible, and I believe God. I believe God created woman from the side of Adam. He took a rib, and from there, woman was created. I don't apologize for that, and I'm thankful. Let God be true, and every man a liar if necessary. I'm going to believe the Word of God, and I'm going to believe in God. I believe that God parted the Red Sea. I don't have to understand how he did it, and I don't have to try to figure it out scientifically. I just know that by the power of God's will, he can do anything. He spoke this world into existence just simply by his will and his power. He holds this earth right here in the perfect orbit that it's been in for thousands of years just by his power and his will. I believe that he did part the Red Sea. I believe that he sent manna for 40 years for the children of Israel feeding over around 3 million people for 40 years manna from heaven. I believe that when the children of Jericho walked, when the children of Israel walked around Jericho, I believe on that seventh day that the walls came tumbling down. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe that Jesus Christ healed the blind. I believe that he healed the lame. I believe he raised the dead. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that he was buried. And I believe with all of my heart that he set all of those that were in paradise free when he went into the depths of the earth. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And I believe like the songs have already been sung about today that Jesus Christ is coming back to this world one of these days. Why do you believe the Bible, some might say? Because it has never, never, never been proven wrong. Never, ever been proven wrong. Scientifically, they've tried to prove it wrong, but they cannot prove it wrong. Not one thing in the Bible have they been able to prove wrong scientifically. Archaeology-wise, they can't prove it wrong. They're still digging up places out there in the sand, in the desert, and they're still seeing how that this confirms the Word of God. And the Word of God has to be none other than God's Word. Because if it wasn't God's Word, they'd find all kind of errors in it. Historically, it would have been proven false. Scientifically, it would have been proven false. But also we need to realize that archaeology, historically, scientifically, none of this has been able to say that the Word of God has any errors in it whatsoever. Then, of course, you're going to run into a lot of people. And you might be one of them here this morning. And you'll say, well, okay, preacher, Mr. Know-it-all, what about creation? What about creation? Well, I want to tell you something about creation. There is a reason why they call it the theory of evolution. They call it a theory. Do you know what that means? That means it's not a proven fact. It's simply a theory. But I'm here to tell you that the Word of God has proved itself countless numbers of time, over thousands of years, backed up by science, backed up by history, backed up by archaeology. I believe without any apology that there's no doubt about it that the Bible is God's Word. Matter of fact, in your Bible, the Bible will clearly tell us the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Again, the Bible will go on to tell us in the Scriptures all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even again, the Bible tells us 
wonderful things about the scriptures. The Bible says that the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to tell you right now that it was God who gave us the word of God. He guided the hands of those that wrote it. Over 40 different people helped write the Bible. It took about 1,400 to 1,500 years for God to have this completely accomplished the way that he wanted it done. But even as he called people to write this down, he, by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, guided their hand, guided their thoughts. There was no way that God was going to allow a mere mortal man to interfere with his word that we need so desperately in this day and time that we live in. We can count upon the word of God. It is something that we can stand upon. It is something that will never change. The word of God is no doubt about it to me. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm here to tell you today that it's infallible. What do you mean infallible? I believe it's inerrant. I really and truly believe with all my heart that God has given us what he meant and he meant what he said. Amen. The word of God is the word of God. When the Bible speaks about heaven, man, I believe it. Amen. When the Bible speaks about heaven, I believe it. In heaven, there's not going to be no death. Hallelujah. In heaven, there's not going to be no more death. I believe that. Why? Because God's word says that. And I believe God. Amen. When the Bible starts talking about that in heaven, that there'll be no more death in heaven. When the Bible says that in heaven, there'll be no more sin. Thank God. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? To live in a place where there is no sin. Hallelujah. The devil ain't going to be there. Or the demons of hell are not going to be there. What a utopia. What a garden of Eden. What a Shangri-La. I'm here to tell you, isn't that exciting church? Just to know God's given us his word that there is a place called heaven. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible because I believe it's God's word. And I believe God here today. I believe in heaven there's not going to be no sickness. Can we get an amen out of that? No sickness in heaven. Glory be unto God. Uh, that's an exciting thing. Why do you believe that preacher? Because God said so. I believe it because I believe God. Amen. I believe there's a heaven. I believe that I has not seen such a thing as God has created for us when we get there. Amen. Aren't you excited about that? I can tell. Calm down. Calm down. All right. You're getting too rowdy out there. All right. I believe that with all my heart, that ear hath not heard all that God has got going on. Woo! Can you imagine what it's like up there in heaven right now? I mean, can you honestly imagine that? The beauty, the scenery, the choirs, the angels, all of our friends and relatives that have gone on before us and all that beautiful singing and music like we've been having here today. I also believe the Bible when it says there is a hell. Amen? I believe when it says there's a heaven, well, if I believe the Bible, and I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then I also got to believe when Jesus says that there is a hell. Now, this morning, I want us to look at just a few things that Jesus has had to say about hell itself. Now, Jesus preached on hell more than he preached on heaven. That's a fact. Jesus preached on hell more than he preached on heaven. What well, the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5 verse number 29. These are the words of Jesus. Do you believe the Bible this morning? Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Do you believe the Bible when the Bible says there's a heaven? If you believe that when the Bible says that there's a heaven. And you believe that the Bible is the word of God. You also got to believe that there's a hell. This is not a smorgasbord. This is not a buffet table. You've got to take the whole thing. It's kind of like when you sit down at home, not when we go to Golden Corral. When I was growing up as a little boy, when my mama set down a plate and it had old ter terrible turnips, I mean, I can still, I, I don't even go there. But I had to eat that. I couldn't put the turnips aside. But it's the same thing with the Word of God. You can't just take the things that you like. You just can't take the things, well, I agree with. You can't just take the things that you, that, uh, that you understand. I'm going to tell you right now, you got to take the whole thing. Amen. Not one job, not one tittle shall pass away. There's a lot of things about the Bible I don't understand. 
That there really is. But there's also a lot of things about them computers I don't understand, but guess what? I still call it a computer. Amen. There's a lot of things about God I don't understand, but guess what? I still call him God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I like that. But look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. So we got to believe that if Jesus is saying this, it's true. Here the Bible says, and if you looked it up in your own Bible, it'd be in red, of course. And if thy right hand offend thee, pluck it, pluck, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body should be cast in to hell. Look at verse number 30 there. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body, listen to me, should be cast into hell. How many times did the Lord in this message say that there's a danger of going to hell? And to the Lord, hell was such a terrible place. He said, if your eyes are keeping you from being saved, in other words, you can't take your eye off of sin, you can't take your eyes off of other things that's causing you to want to be saved. You'd be better off being partially blind in this world and be able to go to heaven because you didn't allow what you seen and you didn't allow what you might have lusted after and you didn't really allow these other things to keep you from being saved. You're better off going to heaven with one eye where God will replace it than to wind up in hell with both eyes. Now, that's pretty strong language, but that's coming from Jesus Christ. I believe it. He said, if your right hand offend thee. In other words, you're hanging on to some kind of sin. Friends, I've seen people squeeze them pews so tight, it's a wonder that there's still a postery on, on, on them pews. Honestly, I mean, you speak, I mean, good gracious. I, I've seen God dealing with some of your hearts. I've seen some of you under conviction. I've seen some of you just sitting there just basically bracing yourself and, and trying your best not to make a move for God. But I'm telling you right now, God said, it'd be better off for you to lose that hand if that hand was gonna keep you from coming to God than to wind up going to hell with both your hands. That's strong language, isn't it? But I believe God knows what he's talking about. Amen? Hell is real. Heaven is real. Why? I know it's real. Why? God said so. And I believe God, right? I let every man be a liar. I let every man be a liar, but God be true. Isn't that right? Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Here again, Jesus is preaching about hell. In Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28, look at that. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm here, yeah, that's a powerful message from the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell is real. If it's not real, then Jesus was lying. And Jesus never lied. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. There's no other way to go to heaven but through Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus says concerning hell in the book of Luke chapter 16 and verse number 23. Now in Luke 16 and verse number 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, not just, plural, not just singular, but plural, torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. I'm here to tell you right now, and it's no surprise, that there's a lot of people today that don't believe in hell. There's a lot of people today that don't believe hell is real. You go back and look at those statistics that I gave you when I first started preaching, you'd find out that there's a lot of them, and I mean even Baptists, they don't believe that hell is real. Matter of fact, you're not gonna hear much preaching on hell in Many churches today, that's one of them subjects that a lot of preachers won't even touch because it's one of the least liked topics for a sermon that there is when somebody preaches about hell itself. But here Jesus preached on hell, and if Jesus preaches on hell, then friends, we better start preaching on hell because hell is real, and people are winding up in hell every single second of every single day. Hell is real. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe it's real. 
They believe you go to the grave and that's it unless you're a Jehovah Witness. They believe you're a Jehovah Witness that the day will come when you might get raised out of the grave. But if you weren't a Jehovah Witness, you just deteriorate. It's all over. I'm mean, going to take death as not the end. You don't cease to exist just because you've died. I mean, at the moment of death, your body and soul separates. And your body stays here and returns to the dust. But your soul goes to one of two places. And it's either going to heaven, which I believe is real. And thank God, I'm going there. But it will either go to heaven or it's going to wind up in hell. And hell is a real place. Don't you never underestimate. Don't you never deny it. Because Jesus says that it's real. Don't matter what the Jehovah Witnesses say, they're wrong. It doesn't matter what Christian scientists say, they don't believe it because it can't scientifically be proved. Well, I wonder what do they think's in the center of the earth right now? I mean, even a scientist can tell you that the core of the earth is nothing but molten heat and, and I mean really hot area that's there in the earth. I mean, that's where the souls of all who have rejected Jesus Christ are at right now. I'm, Christian scientists are wrong. They're wrong. Hell is right. Jesus is right. I'm not going to believe a Christian scientist. I don't care if they call themselves Christian or not. I'm not going to believe Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I'm going to believe God. I believe God. I believe God's word. How many times have I already showed you that that's what God is mentioning here? I mean, I'm really telling you, there's a lot of people today that are misled. There's a lot of people that are taking the broad and the wide way, and they're all going to wind up in the lake of fire that's going to last forever and forever. Hell is real. If it wasn't real, then you're going to have to go back to your Bibles, and you're going to have to take out 54 times in your Bible where hell is mentioned. 54, 54, 50. Four times. If it's in there once, that's all it takes for me. But if it's in there 50, four times, then friends, it's time for us to get real about the existence of hell and that there's a lot of souls of people there right now. Billions. Do you hear me? Billions of souls are there right now. In hell, burning in agony and torment. Hell is not only real, but hell is forever. Hell is forever. Now the Catholics believe that about everybody winds up in hell or purgatory for a little while. And through prayers of the people left on earth and through the money that they can give to the Catholic church... They feel like that people in hell can get bought out. They do. They believe that. That ain't got nothing to do with the Word of God. That has something to do with the Pope. Uh, uh, yeah, how many of you Catholic out there? There must be a lot of you. I'm telling you, the Pope is wrong. Hell is real. And if you wind up there, you're going to stay in the burning lakes forever and forever, except for that brief moment God brings you before the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment, and then you'll be taken and cast into the lake of fire, and there ain't no getting out of the lake of fire. Read what your Bible says. I got scriptures for it. The Bible says in the book of Revelations, chapter 20, verse number 10, hell is for real. And right now, I'm telling you right now, in the heart of this earth, there's souls by the billions who are there who never asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of sin, who never asked Jesus Christ to save their soul, and friends, they never let Jesus Christ become the Lord of their life. Look at what Revelation 20 and 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Amen. One of these days, glory unto God, church, he's going to get it. I'm so sick and tired of him. I'm right now, I'd kick him in if God gave me the chance. I mean, help me. I mean, you're sick of him. You're sick of him destroying things. You're sick of him sifting things. You're sick of him destroying things. Friend, I'd give him the boot, and I mean, a half a heartbeat, let him just take a nose dive into the lake of fire, and there he can be in torments forever and forever and forever. Amen. 
Boy, I'm telling you right now, the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, this is after tribulation. He's not going to get kicked in there until the tribulation period is over. That's another sermon in itself. But look at how it says here in the latter part of that verse. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. I'm here to tell you right now, hell's real. It's mentioned 54 times in the Bible. And Jesus here preached on it more than he preached on heaven. And I'm here to tell you right now that heaven is not going to be a place that you're going to go and have a party. You know, I've had some, some people try to tell me that they couldn't wait because they was just going to party in hell. Huh? Have you ever heard somebody come up there and tell you that? I've heard people tell me that. Man, we're going, when I get to hell, we're going to party. You ain't going to be partying in hell. I'm going to tell you right now, when you go back to Luke chapter 16, and you read in verses 19 through verses number 31, you're going to find out that in those passages of scriptures, God tells us that there is going to be a conscious state of every soul that's in hell. Conscious state. And I mean it declares at least 10 different conscious states in the book of Luke chapter 16, starting in verse number 23, going through verse number 31. Now look at verse number 23 real quickly here today. I've still got five minutes. <laughs> All right, look at it. You know the story. I've preached it here before on numerous occasions. But you know the story how the rich man and the poor man Lazarus, they both died. Lazarus went, and he was in the bosom of Abraham in paradise. But the rich man, here he is. This is it right now. He didn't remain in the ground. He didn't remain in a casket. His body did. But his soul wound up in hell instantaneously. Jesus is preaching this message, by the way. And Jesus is saying, and in hell. There it is again, Jesus preaching on hell. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Not just the fire, which had been more than horrible in itself. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. You know what that verse tells me clearly? That in hell, you're going to be able to see. Amen. Now, how many of you would like to see what's going on in hell right now? I'm telling you, you might like to watch some of them monster movies or some of them horror shows. And I mean, today, they get pretty graphic. I mean, really and truly, I mean, they get so graphic today. You ought not be letting your children watch them things. I mean, that ain't for little children to watch. Really and truly, if you have nightmares because you watch it, then you deserve it. <laughs> you're old enough to know better. But listen, in hell, you're going to be able to see what are you going to be able to see? You're going to be able to see the anguish, the torment, the pain, the agony of all these souls that are in hell. Because this man was able to see Abraham afar off. He seen Lazarus over there in Abraham's bosom. You that go to hell, you're going to wind up being able to see everybody there. Everybody there. You're going to be able to see, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But then not only are you going to be able to see, but you're going to be able to recognize. There's people say, well, are you going to recognize me in heaven? <laughs> if they're recognizing one another down there in hell, surely we're going to be able to recognize one another in heaven. Amen. When the rich man looked over, who did he see? Abraham. What did he do? He recognized him. Who else did he recognize? That beggar that had been sitting by the gate while he was living it up, the rich man, the poor man was out there begging for bread. The rich man recognized Lazarus. And I believe with all my heart that not only when you're able to see the fire and the flames and the torment and the agony and, and, the, and all that going on in hell, you're going to be able to recognize them. Some of them are going to be your family members. Listen, church, some of them are going to be your neighbors. Some of them are going to be some of the people you work with. 
If you wind up in hell, you're going to be able to see and recognize them. And in a lot of cases, you don't want to think about this, but in a lot of cases, you'll see your family there with you. You'll see your brothers inflamed, engulfed, burning, agonizing, tormented. Your brothers, your sisters, you'll see them there. You'll recognize them there. They'll be inflamed. And the fire will never be quenched. The fire will never go out. Their soul will never be exhausted. Their soul will never cease to exist. They're just going to be there burning in agony and torment. And you're going to recognize them. And they're going to recognize your state. But dead. Not only will you might see your sisters and your brothers, but dads, you might just see your daughter agonizing, screaming, mashing their teeth. You might even just see your son, your wife, or your wife might see their husband. And you'll remember all the times you mocked God. You'll remember all the times you ridiculed the church, the preacher, the word of God. And there you'll be able to recognize one another as part of the torments of hell as you're on fire, agonizing and burning and screaming and mashing your teeth. Because in hell, you'll be able to recognize, you'll be able to see and you're going to be able to cry out. Look at verse number 24 there. And he what? Cried. And he talked. You know what you're going to hear in hell? You're going to hear your family crying out. You'll hear your brothers. You're going to hear your sisters. You even hear your mom. You hear your dad. You'll hear your children. Because they followed in your footsteps. They followed you right to hell. And you're going to hear them. What horror. I believe I could take the flames better than I could take the horror of healing, hearing some family member engulfed, crying out, wailing, the Bible says, grinding their teeth. You'll be able to hear all this going on and you'll be able to speak. What are you going to do, dads, when your daughter's down there because she followed you, walked in your footsteps? It's a proven fact that the dads are not very involved in serving the Lord. A lot of times the children won't be. Proven fact. And a lot of times they'll just follow their dads or their parents right into hell. And you're going to be able to see them, recognize them, hear them. And when they're in hell and they're screaming, help me, dad, help me. I'm in pain, dad, I'm in pain, I'm burning. God, dad, put out the fire, dad, put out the fire. Dad, help me, help me. And you won't be able to do a thing. You'll be able to cry out. You'll be able to speak in hell. But not only do those verses tell us that you're going to be able to speak, you're going to feel physical ailments such as thirst. Can you imagine what that's like? Lazarus, the rich man, was just praying, Oh, Abraham, please send, send that poor beggar over here. I wouldn't have had nothing to do with him while he was on earth, but I'll take a drop of water from his finger right now. If I could just get a drop of water right now, I'd take it. I'd take it. Oh, there's going to be such pain in hell when people begin to mash their teeth and grind their teeth. But not only that, if you read on into, into this passage of Scripture, as you're going into 24, 25, 26 there, you're going to find out that Abraham responds and Abraham tells this rich man, 
just remember. You're going to remember. If you're lost and you leave here today and you die without Jesus Christ, you'll remember how that you sat there and gave up the opportunity to be saved. How you couldn't wait to get out of the service. How you couldn't stand it when the preacher started giving the invitation and it took more than 30 seconds to give the invitation. You're going to remember every chance you had to be saved. And you wouldn't have had to have been there. Look at what it says there in verse 25. And Abraham said, son, remember. So there's a lot of conscious states that you're going to be in and you're going to be able to hear and you'll be able to have compassion on other people. You know, one of the worst things I really believe about hell, fire is going to be terrible. Thank God I ain't going. <laughs> Whew. I ain't got to worry about it. It's all been settled. But I'm here to tell you right now, in hell, you're going to have compassion for that daughter that's on fire. You won't be able to stand it. You'll have compassion toward that son that's on fire. You won't be able to stand it when they start calling out to you and say, help me, help me, dad, 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 dad. You'll feel the pain along with the, all the other pain that you're feeling already. You can't get to them. You can't help them. Not a thing you can do for them. Now's the time. But it won't be then. Remember this Rich man said to Abraham, I've got five brothers. I don't want them to come here. Ain't no partying in hell. I don't want my brothers to come here. Abraham, send somebody. Send somebody up there and tell them. I don't want them to be tormented. Let me ask you something. If you wind up in hell, it's not just going to be flames of fire, but it's going to be a lot of things. And when you wind up in hell, you're going to be able to recognize, you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to hear, you're going to be crying, and you're going to be able to speak. How is it going to be if you wind up in hell and you just hear a familiar voice one day in the parts of eternity? <laughs> Help me. It hurts. Help me, Dad. It hurts. Oh, it's terrible. I can't stand it. Dad, I can't bear it. Dad, help me, Mama. Help me, Mama. Help me, Mama. You'll want to. But you can't. Hell is real. But so is heaven. We're going to be showing that movie on the 15th of this month. I can only imagine. Go ahead and mark that down and be here. But listen to me. I don't know everything I'm going to do when I get to heaven. But I know I'm going to have plenty of time to do whatever it is I need to get done. But one of the sweetest things about heaven, I think about Jesus, of course. And I think about so many, so many that have gone on before me. But one of the sweetest things about heaven to me is going to be God's my witness. When I'm up there walking down the streets of gold, and mama might be there, mama be there, my dad will be there, my wife will be there, and we're just strolling over heaven one of those moments in eternity I hear, Hey, Dad! Hey, Dad! Wait up. <laughs> glory, glory, hallelujah! Wait up, Dad! <laughs> and then maybe a few years later after that, won't seem but like a second or two, I'll be walking in there with Olivia and Mark or my wife. Then I'll hear, 
another familiar voice or two or three. Papa! Wait up! Papa! Wait up! Here comes my grandchildren. <laughs> Woo! Heaven's real. How you know it's real? Because I believe God. And I believe that God's word is true. But not only is heaven real, so is hell. You don't want to go there. You don't want to see what's going on there. You don't want to hear what's going on there. You don't want to feel what's going on there. But if you go there, it'd be your decision because God's made a way. And that way is through Jesus. No other way but Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. God's speaking to some hearts here today. I can already feel as if though some people are beginning to hold on to that pew and God says, you better let go of that pew. You better let go of that pew. You better get saved today. Quit allowing the devil to control your life. You need to be saved. You need to be saved today. Why don't you come forward right now? These folks are down here praying. Might be for a loved one. Might be for a child, a spouse. Might be for some brother, some sister, some friend, some co-worker. Why don't you come and pray with them? Just let them know you're, you're there and you care about them and you want to pray with them and for them. Amen. The Bible says we're to agree on earth. Amen. So pray with them. Pray with them. But what about you? These folks here with their heads bowed and their eyes closed, you close, you bow your heads right now, right throughout the auditorium right here, right now. I wonder how many of you right now, right now, you're not sure you're going to heaven for sure. You want to go, there's no doubt about it. You're, you want to go, there's no doubt that anybody would really want to wind up in hell. But I wonder right now how many of you, how many of you right here, right now, know for sure that you're going to heaven, raise your hand. You know for sure I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. You can put your hand right back down. But how many of you right here, right now, could not raise your hand? You're not sure. Hell is just as real as heaven. Without Jesus Christ forgiving you of your sins, you're going to wind up there. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do that would merit your own salvation. You can be good as gold, but gold is not going to make it. It's not going to get you into heaven. I wonder right now, you that are here today that are lost and undone, you've never been born again. You've never come before Jesus and said, Jesus, I know, I know you're the son of God. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I'm going to tell you something right now. It won't matter. All the different kinds of sin that's out there in the world right now, it won't matter. There's only one sin that's unpardonable. Don't you commit it here this morning. And that's blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God. When God's given you a chance to be saved, don't you blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God. But other than that, if you're here right now and God's speaking to your heart, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come right now and say, Lord, I know you're the Son of God and I know I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. I'm not perfect by no means. I'm not perfect even now. I'm not perfect even now. See you in just a minute, all right? Let's see. If God's speaking to your heart right now about salvation, why don't you come? Why don't you come? God's speaking to you right here, right now. You're not sure you're saved. You're not sure that right now you'll be able to go to heaven. People are still coming. Why don't you gather with these people? Why don't you pray with these folks that are coming? Let them know that you care about them. You don't want them to wind up in a terrible place called hell. Maybe you couldn't say, you raised your hand a while ago, but God's speaking to your heart right now. You know you need to be saved. Quit saying, I'll do it later. Quit saying, I'll come back tonight. I promise you right now, that if you walk out of here right now, Satan probably won't let you come back tonight. If you listen to him now, you're going to listen to him tonight. 
If you listen to the devil telling you right now, just come back tonight, just come back tonight. To, won't be as many people. Just come back. I'm telling you, if you obey Satan right now when he tells you don't come right now, you're going to obey him tonight when it's time to come to church. You're going to obey him. He's your master. He ain't going to turn loose of you unless you claim Jesus right here, right now, and be set free. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Here's some more coming. Here's some more coming. Josh, where's Josh? I see. Let me pray with this young man right here, Josh. There's some more that needs to come. I'm glad you come forward, young man. God bless you. How about meet with our pastor here? Anybody else that needs to come forward right now? Anybody? God's doing a new thing right here in this church right now. Their souls, will be, I really believe, are going to be saved right here today. There's some people going to be born again. There's some people going to be given a second chance of life. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? I see it on your faces. Quit holding back. Quit guessing. Quit hoping. Start believing. Start believing. Would you come? Would you come? Never been born again. Your life's never changed a bit. You're the same right now as you've always been. You've never changed. Old things had not passed away. Nothing's become new in your life. Why don't you come right now? Why don't you come? Anybody else that needs to come? My hands are going to be clean. My hands are going to be clean. I've done what God's asked me to do. I can shake the dust off my feet. I've done what God's asked me to do. Do you need to come? Holy Spirit's drawing. Holy Spirit of God's dealing with people's lives right here. Their souls are in the balance right now. You don't want to wind up in hell. You don't want to see what's going on there. You don't want to feel what's happening down there in hell right now. You don't want all that going on in your life. Why don't you come? Why don't you come right now? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? God's dealing with hearts. Amen. All right. All right. Tina, do you have something you want to share real quick? All right. Real, real, real quickly, yeah. Real quick. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Tina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amen. All right, as we get prepared to dismiss, I wanted anybody else get saved. Anybody get saved here this morning? Would you just raise your hand? Don't be ashamed. Just Lift your hand up, then you can put it right back down. God bless you. I've been praying for you. I'm thankful. God bless you. It is. See that young man get saved. Anybody else get saved here this morning? Anybody else? All right. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to bow now. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Brother Johnny, Deacon's meeting today at 430? 430. Great time, great opportunity. Yes.
Yes, yes. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's wonderful. Amen. Boy, I'm telling you, we're having a great time in the house of the Lord, and, and uh, I'm excited to see what God's doing. Great, mighty things, such as we thought not. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, let's bow our heads now, and let's be dismissed in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, what a day you've given us, and how glorious it has been, and Lord, we pray you continue to go with us and lead us and guide us, dear God. And Lord, continue to use us as you see fit. Protect us, dear Heavenly Father, for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.